Once again, you're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. What you just heard, ladies and gentlemen, was the triumphal march from Sigurd Jorsolfar, conducted by Greg. And I played it because I've got some wonderful news. It is a triumph, in a way. At least I believe it is, and I think you're all going to be happy, especially those of you who live in the state of Florida, because you're not going to have to pick through all the static on short wave to hear the hour of the time anymore. In fact, we're going to be on a new radio station there, and it's sort of making history in a way, because it's the first radio station in the United States, and maybe even the world, that's broadcast on the SAP or SAP channel, the SAP channel. It's Radio 27, WSAP, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. UHF TV 27, SAP, separate audio program. The executive offices are Skinner Broadcasting Incorporated, 600 West Hillsboro Boulevard, Suite 27, Deerfield Beach, Florida, 33441. Dash one six zero nine. You can phone them, just in case you don't get all this written down, which you know if you listen to this program is a sin. You're not supposed to listen to this program without a pad of paper and a pen or pencil. You're supposed to write everything down. But here's the number, area code 305 all of you folks in Florida, you're going to want to call that number and find out and make sure that you can get this program. Area code 305-480-2727 will be broadcast in stereo, folks. In crystal clear stereo. You will love it. Especially if you're used to hearing it on shortwave radio through all the static and the propagation and the jamming and the teletype stuff and everything else that they tell me is out there interfering. For release, Monday, August 16th, 1993. You're hearing this broadcast on Tuesday. Our first broadcast on Radio 27 was actually last night, folks. Last night. Some of you may have had your TV accidentally set on the SAP channel and you may have heard it. If you did, that's fine. If you didn't, you can hear it from now on. I think it's too late when you hear this program tonight in Florida uh, to get our broadcast tonight, but you'll be able to listen to it tomorrow night in prime time. You don't even have to stay up late anymore, folks. Isn't it wonderful? A new radio station, WSAP, signed on the air Monday, August 16th, 1993, the first of its kind in the nation. America's first radio station on television. What you say? Radio station on television? That's right, folks. You heard it correctly. Home of the All-American talk show team, 24 hours a day, WSAP broadcast with 70,000 watts on the SAP, our separate audio program channel, over UHF TV 27, Fort Lauderdale. Listeners may tune to the station in one of either two ways. So listen very carefully. Write this down. If you live in Florida, you may hear your tape cable system uh, read to you right now. Here's how you can get the hour of the time on WSAP all over the state of Florida. Number one, by tuning to channel six on the following cable systems. Continental Cable, 
Coral Springs Cable, Jones Intercable, TCI Cable of Hollywood, TCI Cable of North Dade, Gulf Pacific Cable of Weston, Bonadventure, and Gold Coast Cable, Miami Beach. Did you hear that, folks? We're going to be in all of the major hotels. After tuning to Channel 6 on cable, then press the SAP button on your TV or remote control to hear Radio WSAP, the hour of the time. Now, the second method by which you can receive WSAP is by connecting a UHF loop antenna, which you can go down and get at Radio Shack, any Radio Shack. Just tell them you want a UHF loop antenna or an outside UHF antenna to the UHF antenna terminals of your television set tuned to channel TV or UHF TV channel 27 and then press the SAP button on your TV or remote control and you will hear WSAP. Skinner Broadcasting Incorporated, owner of TV 27, rebroadcasts CBS Channel 6 WCIX TV over its main video and audio channel, and this will not change, folks. WSAP will air informative and entertaining talk show hosts from around the nation 24 hours a day. Hosts include William Cooper, The Hour of the Time. 8 p.m. Monday through Friday night and more than a dozen more hard-hitting programs dealing with subjects like what really happened in Waco, how the North American Free Trade Agreement will ruin America, and the truth about the Federal Reserve System. These broadcasts are not currently heard in South Florida and according to Roger Skinner, station manager, we expect a lot of people will soon be talking about what they heard on WSAP. Boy, that's an understatement. The hour of the time is liable to get them thrown out of Florida. <laughs> but this is great, folks. All of you people are living in Florida now. You don't have to stay up till midnight and, and tune in to a, a staticky short wave. If you have one of these cable uh, services, or if you're in the Fort Lauderdale area or near Fort Lauderdale where you can receive their 70,000 watt SAP transmission, you can just go down to Radio Shack and hook a UHF loop antenna on the outside of your TV set and uh, pick us up loud and clear. And folks, this is just the beginning because I have something else to tell you. Beginning next week, we're also going to be live on satellite and we'll be live on WWCR from that point on. Now on WSAP in Florida, those will be taped shows we will not be live but we will be live on satellite and w WWCR will be picking us off satellite live and rebroadcasting Monday through Friday night at our regular time. So that also is great news. The satellite is uh, SpaceNet 3. For those of you who have a satellite dish, you can receive us in brilliant uh, digital sound off of SpaceNet 3 channel 21 I believe it's 5.8 audio, but you can uh, get that out of Onset. Just look for Let's Talk Radio Network. It's Let's Talk Radio Network. It'll be the same time that you've been listening to us on WWCR Shortwave, and we will still be on WWCR Shortwave. The only difference is we'll be live. We'll be taped in Florida. So even though you may be listening to a program that uh, takes in live calls, in Florida, you will not be able to call because you will actually be listening to a tape, a taped program of a previous program or whatever. Um, so that's great news, folks. Remember, we're starting on WSAP last night in Florida. Last night. We're already on the air there. And we're starting next week on satellite, SpaceNet 3, Channel 21, and I believe it's 5.8 audio. Uh, if we're not on 5.8, just go up and down the audio scale until you find us, or you can just look it up in Onset Magazine. So that's all the great news, folks, and I, I hope you're just as happy as I am because I'm tickled pink. I'm so happy I don't know what to do with myself, and uh, it's going to keep me very busy. Uh, of course, expenses are going way up. Our sponsor is picking up the cost of the satellite and the airtime but we're having to purchase an awful lot of expensive equipment so we'll be able to take your calls on the air live uh, we're not going to do it all the time but we are going to do it 
and uh, we need your help folks we need donations to pay for all this equipment we need a thousand dollars to pay for what's called a compressor uh, I don't really know what that means but in order to take phone calls and in order to send this broadcast live to the satellite uplink station we need something that's called a compressor <coughs> and that costs a thousand dollars it's nine hundred and something dollars is the actual price so we need donations we need to purchase that piece of equipment we need to purchase uh, another well we need to purchase a whole bunch of stuff altogether it's going to cost us right around uh, five thousand little over five thousand dollars we will appreciate your contributions all your contributions will be go to uh, pay for equipment only so please folks sit down and write out a check or send us a money order or if you want to send cash that's okay too just make sure it's wrapped up good so the postal people can't hold it up to the light and see that there's cash in your envelope um, please help us out if you enjoy this show if you'd like this to be on live and be able to take your calls uh, then we need donations we cannot afford this equipment um, so please write out a check or money order in whatever amount you can afford to donate and send it to me William Cooper make your checks and money orders out to William Cooper send them to me and the money will go to pay for this new equipment that we need and I'm gonna thank you in advance because I know that a lot of you are going to uh, send uh, your contributions and uh, some of you I know from past uh, will send some substantial contributions um, anything that's left over will go into a fund for a future purchases of equipment and things that we may need uh, we're looking to uh, maybe get into a television and get that up on satellite and uh, downlink to a lot of independent stations across the nation so folks please please reach deep down into your pockets send us as much as you can possibly afford so that we can begin to do this we got a lot of sheeple out there we've got to wake up we have a lot of good people we must empower and we've got to together save freedom for this whole world not just for this country but for the world all of us working together make the hour of the time sort of a central focal point now I want to read to you an article under my view in the commentary section of my favorite magazine some of you already know what magazine this is because I've talked about it an awful lot on the hour of the time it's Backwoods Home magazine edited and published by my good friend Dave Duffy up in Ashland Oregon it's a practical journal of self-reliance did you hear what I said it's a practical journal of self reliance self-reliance it's called backwoods home magazine this just came in the mail I just got this out of my mailbox yesterday it's the September October 1993 edition edition number 23 and uh, uh, I'm gonna tell you how you can subscribe to this magazine so write this down right now folks all you've got to do is call this number area code five zero three four eight eight two zero five three that's area code five zero three four eight eight two zero five three now let me tell you some of the articles that are in this issue of course there's notes from the publisher letters and editorial which I'm going to read to you called no ideology no agenda recipes book reviews in this book review section they're reviewing a book called wild game cookbook an American game cooking under magazine review they review the American spectator just for kids how kids can grow a backwoods kitchen garden laboratory water test offer you can get your water tested real cheap through backwoods home magazine much less than it would cost you to do it on your own and you'll know exactly what you're drinking there's an index of previous issues they have some books for sale a reader survey subscription information classified advertising uh, in this issue they have uh, building tools and housing trusses low-cost marvels to roof over most large spaces tells you exactly how to do it from start to finish under alternative energy solar panel testing and repair if you have solar panels in your house or your home this tells you how to test and repair those panels completely in this issue they don't do partial articles or get you interested in something and then leave you hanging 
under self-sufficiency, food and guns, harvesting from nature, slaughtering and butchering, prepare your rifle before deer season, harvesting the black-tailed deer, nuclear superstition, under money, planning to make a living in the country, saving is the first step to an independent country life, under farm and garden, here's a step-by-step -step guide to wholesome, safe canning. Annie and I learned how to can from Backwoods Home magazine over a year ago, and believe me, it has certainly helped us lower our food bills. Americana and Society, they have a complete article on the history of the Oregon Trail and another article, Reliving the Oregon Trail. This magazine, folks, is the most fantastic magazine I've ever seen. It is my favorite magazine above all others. I can't wait for it to come in the mail. Call Dave Duffy and subscribe to this magazine now. The, it's area code 503-488-2053. 503-488-2053. I'll repeat it later in the program. And uh, tell them that you heard about Backwoods Magazine on the hour of the time. This is not a commercial, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Backwoods Home doesn't even know I'm doing this. Dave Duffy doesn't even know I'm doing this tonight. Okay? I'm doing this because I believe in this magazine. I believe it should be in every home in America. Every home in America. Area code 503-488-2053. Tell Dave Duffy you heard it on the hour of the time and ask him if you can still get the $2 off the subscription rate. In any case, whether you pay the full subscription or get the $2 off, it doesn't make any difference. This magazine is worth every single penny, folks. So all you got to do is call that number. They will start your subscription right away and they'll send you a bill. You don't even have to send the money first. That's the kind of person Dave Duffy is. And that's just one of the reasons why he's my good friend. Okay, let me read this article to you. This article is <laughs> is really funny. It's called No Ideology, No Agenda. And it's kind of a spoof. And Dave Duffy has written up here, We're delighted to give this issue's editorial space over to P.J. O'Rourke, who delivered these comments to a gathering of the Cato Institute, a free market think tank. O'Rourke has authored several books, including Parliament of Whores, a bestseller about the United States government, Congress in particular. And this article is reprinted with permission from the July 1993 American Spectator. The Cato Institute has an unusual political cause, which is no political cause whatsoever. We are here tonight to dedicate ourselves to that cause, to dedicate ourselves, in other words, to nothing. We have no ideology, no agenda, no catechism, no dialectic, no plan for humanity. We have no vision thing, as our ex-president would say, or as our current president would say, we have no Hillary. All we have is the belief that people should do what people want to do, unless it causes harm to other people, and that had better be clear and provable harm. No nonsense about secondhand smoke or hurtful, insensitive language, please. I don't know what's good for you, you don't know what's good for me, we don't know what's good for mankind, and it sometimes seems as though we're the only people who don't. It may well be that gathered right here in this room tonight are all the people in the world who don't want to tell all the people in the world what to do. This is because we believe in freedom. Freedom! What this country was established upon, what the Constitution was written to defend, what the Civil War was fought to perfect. Freedom is not empowerment. Empowerment is what the Serbs have in Bosnia. Anybody can grab a gun and be empowered. It's not entitlement. And entitlement is what people on welfare get. And how free are they? It's not an endlessly expanding list of rights. The right to education. The right to health care. The right to food and housing. That's not freedom. That's dependency, and most people never learn that. Those aren't rights. Those are the rations of slavery, hay and a barn for human cattle. There is only one basic human right, the right to do as you damn well please, and with it comes the only basic human duty, the duty to take the consequences. So, we are here tonight in a kind of antimatter protest, an unpolitical undemonstration by deeply uncommitted inactivists. We are part of a huge, invisible picket line that circles the White House 24 hours a day. We are participants in an enormous non-march on Washington. 
millions and millions of Americans not descending upon the nation's capital in order to demand nothing from the United States government. To demand nothing, that is, except the one thing which no government in history has been able to do, and that is, leave us alone. Leave us alone. There are just two rules of governance in a free society. One, mind your own business, and two, keep your hands to yourself. Bill Clinton, keep your hands to yourself. Hillary, mind your own business. We have a group of incredibly silly people in the White House right now. People who think government works, or that government would work, if you got some real bright young kids from Yale to run it. We're being governed by dorm room bull session. The Clinton administration is over there right now pulling an all-nighter in the West Wing. They think that if they can just stay up late enough, they can create a healthy economy and bring peace to former Yugoslavia. The Clinton administration is going to decrease government spending by increasing the amount of money we give to the government to spend. Makes sense, doesn't it? Health care is too expensive, so the Clinton administration is putting a high-powered corporate lawyer in charge of making it cheaper. Now, this is what I always do when I want to spend less money, hire a lawyer from Yale. Now, if you think health care is expensive now, wait until you see what it costs when it's free. The Clinton administration is putting together a program so that college graduates can work to pay off their school tuition. As if this were some genius idea. It's called getting a job. Most folks do that when they get out of college, unless, of course, they happen to become governor of Arkansas. And the Clinton administration launched an attack on people in Texas because those people were religious nuts with guns. Hell, this country was founded by religious nuts with guns. Who does Bill Clinton think stepped ashore on Plymouth Rock? Peace Corps volunteers? Or maybe the people in Texas were attacked because of child abuse. But if child abuse was the issue, why didn't Janet Reno tear gas Woody Allen? You know, if government were a product, selling it would be illegal. Government is a health hazard. Governments have killed many more people than cigarettes or unbuckled seat belts ever have. Government contains impure ingredients, as anybody who's looked at Congress can tell you. On the basis of Bill Clinton's 1992 campaign promises, I think we can say government practices deceptive advertising. And the merest glance at the federal budget is enough to convict the government of perjury, extortion, and fraud. There, ladies and gentlemen, you have the Cato Institute's program in a nutshell. Government should be against the law. Term limits aren't enough. We need jail. Again, that was written by P.J. O'Rourke. Folks, subscribe to Backwoods Home Magazine. I'm going to give you the number once more to call. All you have to do is call it. Start your subscription right off the bat, and they'll send you a bill. You don't even have to send in any money. Dave Duffy will trust you to pay your bill when you receive it. Call area code 503-488-2053. That's 503-488-2053. One more time. 503-488-2053. Subscription, folks, is regularly $17.95, I believe. And if you tell Dave Duffy that you heard about it on this show, he might give you a $2 discount. But since he didn't pay for advertising and I didn't check with him and he doesn't even know I'm doing this, I don't know if he will or not. But even if you pay the full subscription price, folks, Backwoods Home Magazine is worth it. You will learn how to become self-sufficient. You will learn so much out of Backwoods Home Magazine that it's incredible. And you can order two books. One is called The Best of the First Two Years of Backwoods Home Magazine, and the second one is The Third Year. <laughs> and, oh, it's incredible, The Best of the Third Year. The Best of the First Two Years, then The Best of the Third Year. And uh, these are incredible books. We've ordered both of them. We have the magazine. And, yes, we paid for every single bit of it, folks, because... It's the best magazine in this country today, bar none. I guarantee it. So, order your copy. Oh, boy. You know, I'm just so happy about going up on satellite and about 
going into 500,000 new homes in uh, Florida and we began that last night this is it's just incredible I don't know what to do with myself I'm gonna have to uh, take a deep breath and uh, settle down here and just sort of get everything together or I'm probably gonna screw something up I remember when we're on satellite we're going to be doing some live shows where you'll be able to call in and talk to me on the air let me give you that number right now this is a number where 23 hours out of every day you can fax me anything you want to fax me that's 23 out of every 24 hours you can fax me whatever you want to fax me so now you have a conduit to deliver information directly to the hour of the time with a fax machine if you don't have a fax machine you can go down to copies R us or copy place or copy land or whatever they call it in your town mailbox express or or whatever it is and uh, for a small fee you can still fax us whatever you want to fax us it's very easy to do folks and we'll get it and we'll uh, look at it and if it's important we'll put it on the air if uh, if we can build a show out of it maybe we will first we check everything out though to make sure that it's, it, that it's real and uh, um, the other hour remember I said 23 hours out of every 24 the other hour the phone will either be used to call in to talk to me live on the hour of the time or if we're not doing a live show the phone will be disconnected okay so just remember that now the phone number write this down is six zero two three 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 two one seven four that's six zero two three 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 two one seven four one more time six zero two three 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 two one seven four it's time to take our break folks don't go away I'll be right back after this very brief pause well folks I'm going to take you one step further in your education tonight I am holding in my hands dear listeners an old very old book published in 1883 in Philadelphia by Collins and McDill the name of this book is in the coils or the coming conflict again this book was published in 1883 in Philadelphia by Collins and McDill the title is in the coils or the coming conflict by E B G this is the second edition which means there was an edition before this and there's a quote here by Wendell Phillips who says this is the next great question that the nation must take up and decide and this book ladies and gentlemen is priceless for it describes it was originally uh, copyrighted in 1882 actually not copyrighted but entered according to act of Congress in the year 1882 by A.T. McDill in the office of the librarian of Congress at Washington DC so if you can't find this anywhere else it is in the library of Congress this is about one man's battle with Freemasonry and I'm going to read to you a letter which begins on page 237 this letter is written by Dr. Groves and sent to a Mr. Dover Brandon May 18th my dear friend I have delayed a reply to your note in order that I might be able to answer both your questions fully and with some degree of certainty I'm glad to be able to say that I am personally acquainted with your nephew and that I highly esteem him I have consulted several influential men in our village and we all agree in our opinion of Bates and his prospects in this precinct so I can answer both of your questions together and use the plural we and our instead of showing you mine opinion alone we believe Bates to be the best candidate in the field as yet and it is possible that he will have our hearty support we are not altogether satisfied with any of our candidates but we do not expect to find one that will suit us in every particular we may consistently support a person and yet have some objection to him so in regard to Bates we have one serious objection to him but whether that will be in our way of supporting him depends upon circumstances I suppose you want a plain statement of the whole matter rather than any uncertain and flattering promises 
and I will not be kept back by fear of offending you or by a desire for office or popularity from stating clearly our objection to Bates and the circumstances in which he may probably expect our support. We do not object to his abilities, moral character, republicanism, relatives, or general fitness for the place. We appreciate him for all these. Our only objection to him is that by certain and numerous oaths which he considers binding, we do not, however, he has pledged his support to a monopoly which is more powerful and dangerous than those which he professes to oppose and has sworn his allegiance to a government which claims supremacy over all other authority whether of church or state. In a word, as we are informed, Mr. Bates is a Freemason. Now we know that everyone who enters the Lodge swears, quote, to support the Constitution of the Grand Lodge of the State and to conform to the laws of any Lodge of which he shall be a member, and also to obey all regular signs, summons, or tokens from any Mason or body of Masons. Now, whatever he may be told before taking this oath, after he does so, he is taught that the authority of the Lodge is absolute, the covenant is irrevocable, and its obligations are supreme. In general, Ahiman Rizan, or the Freemason's Guide, we read, quote, The candidate entering the lodge is on the point of binding himself voluntarily, absolutely, and without reservation forever. Webb's Monitor says, The covenant is irrevocable. Even though a Mason may be suspended or expelled, though he may withdraw from the lodge, journey into countries where Masons cannot be found, or become a subject of despotic governments that persecute, a communicant of bigoted churches that denounce Masonry, he cannot cast off or nullify his Masonic covenant. No law of the land can affect it, no anathema of the church can weaken it, it is irrevocable." Unquote. Again, this same Masonic author says, quote, The first duty of the reader of this synopsis is to obey the edicts of his Grand Lodge, right or wrong, his very existence as a Mason hangs upon obedience to the power immediately set above him. Failure in this must infallibly bring down expulsion, which as a Masonic death ends all. The one unpardonable crime in a Mason is contumacy or disobedience, unquote. Although it takes much space in my letter, let me give you more testimony with the names of the witnesses who are all eminent members of the order and high in authority and some of whose works are in nearly every lodge and necessarily have some effect on the members. Quote, that this surrender of free will to Masonic authority is absolute within the scope of the landmarks of the order and perpetual may be inferred from an examination of the emblem the shoe or sandal which is used to enforce this lesson of resignation." Unquote. That's from the Morris Dictionary of Freemasonry. Quote, Disobedience is so subversive of the groundwork of Masonry in which obedience is so strongly inculcated that the Mason who disobeys subjects himself to severe penalties. Unquote. I bid. Quote, a Grand Lodge is invested with power and authority over all the craft within its jurisdiction. It is the Supreme Court of Appeals in all Masonic cases, and to its degrees, unlimited obedience must be paid by every Lodge and every Mason situated within its control. The government of Grand Lodges is, therefore, completely despotic. While a Grand Lodge exists, its edicts must be respected and obeyed without examination by its subordinate lodges." Unquote. That's from Mackey, Lexicon of Freemasonry, page 183. Quote, For ourselves we deny as Masons that any civil government on earth has the right to divide or curtail Masonic jurisdiction when once established. It can only be done by competent Masonic authority and in accordance with Masonic usage." Unquote. From the Grand Lodge Report. Quote, a due summons from the Lodge or Grand Lodge is obligatory upon him, and should he refuse obedience, he will be disgracefully expelled from the society with public marks of ignominy that can never be erased." Unquote. That's from the Morris Dictionary of Freemasonry, page number 29. 
quote, disobedience and want of respect to Masonic superiors is an offense for which the transgressor subjects himself to punishment, unquote. That's from Mackey, Masonic Jurisprudence, page 511. Quote, hence we find that the master's authority in the lodge is as despotic as the sun in the firmament which was placed there by the creator never to deviate from its accustomed course till the declaration is promulgated that time shall be no more, Unquote. That's from Oliver's Signs and Symbols of Freemasonry, page 142. Quote, treason and rebellion also, because they are altogether political offenses, cannot be inquired into by a lodge, and although a mason may be convicted of either of these acts in the courts of his country, he cannot be masonically punished, and notwithstanding his treason or rebellion, his relation to the lodge, to use the language of the old charges, remains indefeasible." Unquote. That's from Mackey's Masonic Jurisprudence, page 510. I'm going to read that again, and I want you to pay close attention. Quote, Treason and rebellion also, because they are altogether political offenses, cannot be inquired into by a lodge. And although a mason may be convicted of either of these acts in the courts of his country, he cannot be masonically punished. And notwithstanding his treason or rebellion, his relation to the lodge, to use the language of the old charges, remains indefeasible. Unquote. That's from Mackey, Juris, Masonic Jurisprudence, page 510. Quote, there is no duty more forcibly enjoined in Masonry than that of warning a brother of danger impending to his person or interests. To neglect this is a positive violation of obligation and destroys any person's claim to be entitled a Mason. Unquote. That's from Morris's Dictionary of Freemasonry, page 325. Quote, the powers and privileges of the master of a lodge are by no means limited in extent. Unquote. That's from Chase's Digest of Masonic Law, page 380. Quote, As a presiding officer, the master is possessed of extraordinary powers which belong to the presiding officer of no other association. Unquote. That's from Mackey, Masonic Jurisprudence, page 344. Quote, the system of Masonic law has little of the Republican or Democratic spirit about it. Unquote. That's from Morris, Webb's Freemasons Monitor, Revised Edition, page 195. Quote, once a Mason, always a Mason. Once a Mason, everywhere a Mason, however independent, either as individuals or as lodges whether grand or subordinate, and we are each and all truly free and uncontrolled by anything save our ancient laws and constitution. Yet no Mason can be a foreigner to another Mason. We are all equal citizens of one common government, having equal rights, equal privileges, and equal duties, and in which government, thank God, the majority does not govern. For our order, in its very constitution, strikes at the root of that which is the very basis of popular government. It proclaims and practices not that the will of the masses is wise and good, and as such to be obeyed, not that the majority shall govern, but that the law, in effect above mentioned ancient law, shall govern. Our tenet is not only that no single man, but that no body of men, however wise or numerous, can change in any degree one single landmark of our ancient institution. Our law is strictly organic. It cannot be changed without being destroyed. You may take a man to pieces, and you may take a watch to pieces, but you cannot alter his organs and put him together again, as you do the timekeeper. Masonry is the living man, and all other forms of government mere convenient machines made by clever mechanics for regulating the affairs of state. Not only do we know no north, no south, no east, and no west, but we know no government save our own. To every government save that of masonry, and to each and all alike, we are foreigners. And this form of government is neither pontifical, autocratic, monarchical, republican, democratic, nor despotic. It is a government per se, and that government is Masonic. We have nothing to do with forms of government, forms of religion, or forms of social life. 
We are a nation of men only bound to each other by Masonic ties as citizens of the world, and that world, the world of Masonry. Brethren to each other, all the world over, foreigners to all the world beside. The above is a Masonic address in a nutshell. It is the compressed essence of Masonic life." Unquote. It's taken from the Missouri Grand Lodge Report for 1867. What a remarkable array of Masonic testimony, and yet the half has not been told. I might go on almost indefinitely showing its foul, treasonable, and anti-Republican nature as legibly portrayed under these extracts from standard Masonic publications. The above sentences are complete quotations and not garbled. They are concise and plain. The language is authoritative. Masonic superiors never argue with subordinates they dictate. No wonder a most prominent member admits the following. Quote, there is no charge more frequently made against Freemasonry than that of its tendency to revolution and conspiracy and to political organizations which may affect the peace of society or interfere with the rights of government." Unquote. Taken from Mackey, Mystic Ties of Freemasonry, page 43. Remember, my friend Dover, that I am not speaking of your nephew's personal views of the supremacy of the Lodge, nor saying what he would do if he should find that some of the law's summonses or orders of the Lodge should conflict with his duties to the government, but merely showing you what the Lodge, according to its standard author's claims, and what every Mason has sworn to perform. If Mr. Bates should go to Congress and then find in some cases that he must violate either his official oath or Masonic obligation, I do not say which he would consider binding. But I do say, for I know that the Lodge, by its writers, its lecturers, and its decrees, declares that its obligations are supreme, its authority above all civil authority, and obedience to his superiors the first duty of every Mason. If eminent members know and tell the truth about their own order, if Grand Lodge reports can be believed, there can be no doubt on this point. Please read again carefully what these have said. Yes, dared to print, and you will see our objection to sending Bates to Congress, or electing him or any Mason to any office until he renounces his allegiances to the Lodge. Do you think that we demand too much? Every other foreigner, before he is allowed even to vote, must renounce his allegiance to the government under which he was born, and to which perhaps he has never sworn or acknowledged obedience. We require of him, and properly, the following obligation. Quote, I do declare an oath that it is bona fide my intention to become a citizen of the United States and to renounce and abjure forever all allegiance and fidelity to all and every foreign prince, potentate, state and sovereign, and particularly blank, fill in whatever country he came from, of whom I am a subject." Unquote. Is it then right for free citizens of this country to vote into any office a person who has sworn and still lives under and acknowledges allegiance to another, a monarchical and a despotic government? Has not the Grand Lodge of one state, in consistency with the general teaching of Masonry, declared that all its members are foreigners to our government? Let us then consider them as such, and our government also should consider them as such, and forbid them to hold office, sit on the jury, or even to vote until they take the oath prescribed for other foreigners. When I tell you that the most puissant sovereign grand commander of the United States, of whom every Mason in the country is a sworn subject, is an ex-Confederate general whose rebel hands are deeply dyed by the crimson blood of loyal citizens, and who at one battle of the late war led a brigade of Indians against the boys in blue, who by these cruel savages were murdered, scalped, and mutilated in a manner too barbarous for description, you will see more force in this argument. And why was not the arch traitor, the leader of the rebellion, hung when captured? He and the President of the United States and many congressmen and judges were royal arch masons and had sworn each to the following. Quote, Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will aid and assist a companion royal arch mason when engaged in any difficulty, and espouse his cause so far as to extricate him from the same, if in my power, whether he be right or wrong." Unquote. 
Is it not reasonable then to suppose that these men, who had sworn to fulfill their duties as civil officers, chose rather to obey Masonic obligations and extricate a rebel from his difficulty? This is the only explanation of this strange event which is worthy of any consideration and it is made more certain when we remember that, according to Mackey's jurisprudence, treason and rebellion also, because they are altogether political offenses, cannot be inquired into by the Lodge. These facts concerning the oaths and teachings of the Lodge will explain many other strange things in the history of our country. They will often explain why some improper person is nominated and elected to some office, or the illegal contestant is given the seat, or a criminal is acquitted or pardoned and perhaps promoted. Why was our present representative, who you say has not brains enough to be a pedophoging lawyer, and who is notoriously dishonest, sent to Congress? Why was he nominated by our party? In answer to this question, the WASP, whose editor is an anti-monopolist, but also inconsistently a Mason, says, quote, Because, as the superintendent of our main railway told a prominent man before the convention which nominated him, the present incumbent was this company's most available candidate because he was high up in Masonry, unquote. Thus he admits that the Lodge is used for the purpose of securing improper nominations and electing to office unworthy men, and certainly implies that it is used to control them while in office. So you see our objection to any Mason going to Congress, and our only objection to the nomination of Mr. Bates. The one condition on which we will give him our united and hearty support is that he goes before the clerk of the United States Court and takes the oath required of all foreigners, inserting the word free masonry in the blank. I have given you freely and honestly a lengthy statement of this case, but if there is anything further you desire to know, I would be glad to answer your inquiries. I should be glad to receive a visit from you at any time. Yours, Warren Groves, in our Dover, Princeton. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you understand the import of what I have just read to you, and I hope that you understand that many of the leaders in the Patriot community are Freemasons. They are sworn to the order, to their one world government of which they only are citizens. And they have no allegiance to any other government, organization, oath, creed, or religion. By their own writings, their own word. Everything that I have quoted that was written in this letter was written or published prior to 1882. The farther back you go in history, the more truth you can read in their words for they have learned that some of us are smarter than they think. And now they conveniently delete some of this from their modern writing, but even in their modern writing you can find enough to incriminate and hang them all. The Confederate general discussed in this letter by Dr. Groves is none other than Albert Pike. And to show you that they are everywhere controlling everything and that you are being brainwashed, when is the last time that you really listened to Star Trek? When is the last time you really listened to the message of Star Trek? When is the last time you understood that the people portrayed in Star Trek owned no private property? <laughs> and everything in that series is Marxism. Pure socialism, pure and simple. And what is the message of Star Trek? Go rent the movies in the series and watch them one by one, starting with the Star Trek movie and ending with the last one that was made. And you will very quickly come to your senses, especially when you realize that Captain James T. Kirk, when he came upon the scene, relieved one Captain Albert Pike. The initials of Captain James T. Kirk, backwards, are K.T.J., Knights of the Temple of Jerusalem. Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz is a 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite. Get your heads out of your collective asses. Good night, and God bless you all. <laughs>